really important. We, we should not miss any single word from children and youth. So this year in this annual meeting 2024 for Child Protection in Humanitarian Action, we delightedly had three child speakers and two youth speakers. Um, one starting from Taisa, we had we had a really um, oh, she's climate uh, child climate activist from Brazil. She gave us a um, powerful keynote in the beginning of this annual meeting. We had uh, Victoria, um, displaced Ukrainian adolescent. Um, she presented the challenges and opportunities faced by displaced children in and also from Ukraine, as well as child particip participation and accountability to children. We also had a Grace, child climate activist from Mexico, as well and Sergio from Panamanian Red Cross in the panel as a panelist, who shared about how they have been impacted um, by climate crisis and how they have been working um, advocating for protection of children in amid the midst of the climate crisis. Last but not least, um, we had Francesca, a youth speaker who shared about her, her migration journey from Mexico to, to the States. And uh, she also shared her experience participating in Photo Voice project. So they have been working well throughout the meeting in addition to attending the meeting, like us, adults, they have been reflecting the sessions they have attended and worked on, well, what they have learned, what they want to know more, or what they want us to change more. So, well, they have been reflecting those and then worked on the messages to us, particularly child protection workers. So, I'm delighted to introduce Grace. She will open up the closing remarks from children and the youth speakers. Hi. It is unfortunate to know that many youth are not aware of the great impact caused by climate change. Uh, we cannot continue with catastrophic promises, for example, Hurricane, Hurricane Grace that affected all the north section of Puebla, uh, bringing down crops, uh, house, homes, contaminating rivers, among other impacts, especially uh, impacting uh, girls and boys and adolescents. We were affected uh, for over two months, the lack of communication with relatives in a rural context such as mine, we had problems counting with uh, proper education. Uh, we depend on agriculture and our lands. This shows us how vulnerable we are facing any uh, event that can uh, be caused by climate change for all those who dedicate their efforts and work to protect girls boys and adolescents i would really like to raise my voice and call so we don't generalize when we implement the help to listen to local voices each girl and boy and adolescent we have specific needs for each context and for each community Community to provide uh, programs for with sustainable practices where girls and boys and adolescents can learn from your experiences less theory and more practice I think what's most important is to develop um, skills in us like teamwork organization decision making and leadership let's not overestimate rural communities and your uh, uh, original communities knowledge and wisdom because all the production of food which the urban areas get benefit from as well they say that the youth are no longer the future but the present so this highlights the message that i want to bring to the adults if we're not given an opportunity to participate and to be listened 
uh, when we get to that tomorrow that we hope for, we won't have the skills nor the tools to create knowledge and how on how to handle um, and address any problems we are facing. An opportunity is the only thing we request. Each one of us has a mission on this life. Let's find our purpose and please, let's do something else in benefit of our society. Thank you so much. Amazing, thank you, Grace. Now I'm pleased to introduce Victoria. Hello. Uh, for those who didn't have a chance to meet me yet, <laughs> I'm the famous Victoria from Ukraine, the only child present in person in this Alliance annual meeting. Uh, it's great pleasure to me to have that to had had the opportunity to be here and share my experience and learn from all of you. Um, I feel privileged to be here now, standing in front of all you all and express my opinion. I learned so much during this past three, three days. And what got my interest the most is how minorities are discriminated and all the difficulties they go through. In my closing remarks, I want to reflect about inclusive gender, which is about real people and real children. Um, children in most parts of the world still growing in patriarchal society and we children are really affected by it. Um, I thought about children from minority communities and how and about how they go through those difficulties. And I want to say that we have to start from somewhere. We need to bring this topic out and we need to overcome the taboo, we need to produce many platforms and we need to fight against the stigma in this, in this topic. Because most of the adults feel uncomfortable to share and discuss those topics. My message for you in this room is to protect those children that face more challenges and train your staff to do so because 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 in many difficulties like climate crisis or uh, displacement and so on children affected differently depends on their sex gender and sexual orientation children learn uh, from adults and copy their behavior if you want to children to respect other minority children you adults should give them an example and protect them first. Children protection system have to be inclusive to all different identities to ex effectively serve all children at risk and create safe spaces for minority children to reduce the risk of violence. Thank you. Gracias. Thank you so much, Victoria. So last but not least, we still have Sergio. To, so Sergio, floor is yours. Good afternoon, everyone. I would like first to thank you because I have learned m wonderful things from each one of you. I would like to share with you a little bit how my life is and how my social activism has been happening in my community. As a child, I always look for these participation spaces because I saw these problems in my uh, neighborhood in my community, water, drought, contamination of the spaces where I used to play, uh, the surroundings of my school. I always hope to be able to contribute and and twist uh, around things to, in a positive way. I wanted to be able to learn and contribute more and I look for different spaces, institutions, volunteer groups where I could strengthen 
that knowledge um, and that allowed me to participate and be active, but I always got a no for an answer. They said, no, this is not the space, and I saw many um, doors closing. I wanted to say that it's key that the youth and the kids have a voice in identifying the problems. They should be part uh, in the creation of strategies and the creation of solutions for prevention and responses facing challenges. It's key that we recover those playground spaces that generate uh, cohesion. It's important to foster the spaces for uh, the youth who are activists. We need to provide the tools for them to participate these networks allow us to share experiences and resources. We need to make these efforts visible. We have the power to do it. Not only we acknowledge the work of uh, the youth, but we inspire others to join us and to contribute with their inputs. I would like to ask you to not forget the importance of fostering the skills of youth. In my case, teaching has always been easy. Since I was eight years old, I have always tried to teach and share whatever uh, I learned because I like sharing what I learned. I like um, others to uh, know what I have learned. We need we need uh, the youth to be able to create their own alliances and collaborations without depending all, depending always on external organizations. It's important that they can promote their own resilient and sustainable actions. We need to believe in them. We need to believe in the youth and, and the ch in children. We need to give them the opportunity to express their voice. If you say no to kids and to the youth, uh, they will find a way for a yes, believe it, they will find a space to raise their voice, we will do it. Once and again, with more and more strength. These skills um, managed uh, independently by the youth, um, do you believe it's fair that the, our children and the youth, instead of uh, focusing and learning and dreaming in the future, we need to find spaces to raise our voice because the adults do not do it, we'll be there because our future is at risk and our dreams are at risk and our lives are at risk. So. Um, I want to ask you again, uh, Victoria, only her, please stand up and give us a, 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 an applause. Can you do it? Only, only Victoria. Can you hear that? That's a single voice. It's a, a young person raising her voice only herself by herself but it's beautiful um, and I liked it because you had that impulse and that feeling. So let's stand up all together. And let's give uh, a round of applause together. Stronger. Now let's stand up and applaud stronger. It's beautiful when we all do it together, when we do it as a single uh, strand, and when we support each other. We all do a beautiful uh, work. We want to thank you for creating those spaces for the youth to participate and raise their voices. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> How do us adults follow that? Oh, um, I had a little sneak preview of those remarks and I knew they'd be good, but they're much more powerful when delivered by the children. I think we've been called on to build and engage children so that they can be ready to create change once they're adults. Not that they're not creating it now, but if we don't, we don't build them as children, then they'll be less ready as adults. And that children need us to be the role models to advocate for diversity and inclusion. They're expecting that from us. And the importance of solidarity, amazing. So we're gonna move now. Well, firstly, I wanted to say thank you to our steering committee members for continuing to champion child participation and to facilitate child participation at the annual meeting. We're a small secretariat, so we've worked hard to, to support, but really we couldn't have done this without the steering committee members' leadership and, and action. Um, but now we're gonna hear from a selection of adults um, from our participant groups. So we have a donor representative, UN, INGO and national NGO members. Um, 
first, I'd like to welcome to the stage Marco Grazia, who's Global Director of Child Protection and Education in Emergencies at World Vision's Disaster Management and Technical Resources Team. It's a long one. Uh, and he's also co leader of the Alliance and member of the Alliance Steering Committee. So if you can squeeze behind me. Marco, welcome to the stage. Nuria Elkut, Senior Policy Advisor for Children in Armed Conflict, uh, Peace Operations Policy and uh, at Global Affairs Canada. Next, Jonas Habimana, Executive Director of the Bureau of Information, Formation, Echange and Research, <laughs> I can't say it in French, um, Paula Development, or BIFED for short, um, who is a member of our steering committee and also recently a member of our executive committee. And finally, Ron Powells, coordinator of the Global Child Protection Area of Responsibility and member of the steering committee, and I'll call it the CPAOR for short. So we'll try to be short and snappy. We're not going to keep you here for hours. They prepared short and snappy responses uh, to a couple of questions. All right, so Marco. As outgoing co-lead of the Alliance, I'd like to invite you to share with us what has excited you about the discussions in the various sessions this week in terms of how escalating crises are affecting children and our capacity to protect them. Thank you, Camilla. When Camilla asked me to do the closing remark, I thought, wow, great, wonderful opportunity to use my Italian eloquence for one hour. I thought a session of one hour, and now it's three minutes. It's almost the same as the, the question, how we, can do, <laughs> yeah, I, how we can do more with less. So I will not stay within the, time, the three minutes, for sure. Thanks. OK. <laughs> First of all, let me appreciate the fact, as a global alliance, we go for the difficult decision to have this meeting in this region. At least logistically, it has been a big challenge. But also, we have chosen a region that tells us a lot in terms of child protection and not always receive the attention that deserve for the huge opportunity to learn that can offer. So it has been an incredibly enriching experience for me, and as I assume for you as well, to drill down through the vast theme of the annual uh, meeting theme, the background paper you have read, and, uh, and look at the specificity of this context. I normally feel the, the guy that is looking at the half glass empty, and now I hear him myself speaking as the half glass full. So that's a little bit of a change even for myself, I would say. It would be impossible to name all the sessions that uh, intrigue me, that interest me, so otherwise I should read the whole agenda. And by the way, I don't have the superpower to be in multiple sessions at once. So, And I also have to complain that not so many have written the learning on the board outside, so I, I'll build on my notes. I know, I'm long, I'm Italian. <laughs> Yesterday, for example, I appreciated the discussion around funding. So it is not all dark and gloomy. And despite someone tried to trick us with this impossible question, how we can do more with less, I appreciated the frank conversation with our donor. I did appreciate the emphasis on the quality rather than quantity that is not a common refrain within the com donor community. It is reassuring to see them on our side, although we know that it's a battle that they have to fight in their own houses. Wearing my education hat, I would say that there is a lot that we can learn from like-minded forum or like-minded uh, interagency work that happened in the education sector in terms of what they did, for example, to bring to the same table humanitarian development funding streams, whatever it is through international development banks or through multilateral fundings, for example. Thinking of resource scarcity, also I appreciated the, and also the need to operate through system strengthening. I appreciated the plenary session around protecting children on the move across and within the border of Mexico on the partnership between national authorities, the UN agency and the civil society to jointly contribute as per each one mandate to the viable solution for the children on the move. And it was a great reminder for me that in our efforts to strengthen system, we should not forget each one's mandate. 
and responsibility to support and build on the system and structure of the context where we operate. On the same vein today, I, for example, I began inspired by the SEEDS program, again, looking at the lessons and the promising practices of promoting community-led initiatives. Uh, this vis-a-vis -vis with the recent uh, progress made by the task force for community level child protection with the new theory of change. Then let me appreciate the children and what we heard from them. Listening to Victoria's session, it was such a powerful experience. Thank you very much, Victoria. She gave us a deep understanding of the uniqueness of children experience impacted by conflict, armed conflict and their experience of displacement. But more importantly, she gave us a very crystal clear explanation of what is accountability to children and why it's important to engage with them. So nothing, without, nothing about me without me. That's a simple slogan that we can use. And I wonder if in the future iteration of the annual meeting, we should walk for, further down the line and engage children in planning our agenda and not having children only as a guest speaker of the annual meeting. The other powerful message came from the first girl, Taisha, who told us on the opening session, we should come back in one year from now, whether it is the next annual meeting, whether it's COP30, I know, stop. <laughs> You'll have to save it for your yeah. second response. <laughs> so she gave us the urgency to act and to come back with successes and not just with new problems. And this resonates also with me, for me as an outgoing co-lead of the Alliance on the everyone expectation on the Alliance. The Alliance became a very credible actor in providing solution and elaborating solution. And well, we haven't solved all the problem yet, probably, but we are a credible and um, a reputable actor in this field. So uh, this is also a good incentive to look at the priority for the next strategic cycle. And let me add the last thing. In fact, the Alliance is not an abstract global entity. The, the Alliance is all of us in this room. And if you or your organization has not joined the Alliance yet, please do so. <laughs> You're worth it. You, you took five minutes, oh, six rather than three, but we'll forgive you. They were good remarks. <laughs> All right, so we're going to move now to Jonas. Um, we haven't yet heard from your context, Jonas, and I think that's that's a shame. So I'm really, really delighted that we get to have you in this closing panel. So my question to you is, um, in Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo, where you are from and where your organization, BFED, operates, the conflict has been going for ongoing for over 20 years and has been said to have taken more lives than the Second World War. And in the past few years, there's been an escalation in the scale of the crisis, and on top of that, um, quite extensive flooding. Can you share more about this with us to bring it to life a little bit for those who haven't yet heard about your context, um, as well as the effects it's having on children and their protection? Of course, picking up on the linkages with what's been discussed this week. Thank you, Camilla. The context of a Democratic Republic of Congo seems to be more particular because uh, we have been facing to armed conflict for more than 20 years, as you said. And uh, based to the UN mapping report, the country has more than 120 armed groups who are operating, especially in the eastern of the country. And uh, for now, we have many people who are displaced and especially children are affected seriously. The crisis is more complex because uh, there is no only armed conflict, but we have also flooding. From 26 provinces, 15 of them last year have been affected by flooding. While the government doesn't have any preparation, no any response plan existing, that shows that the government stills very low in terms of preparation, prevention, 
and response. But uh, based to the 2024 humanitarian response plan, we have seen that uh, around 14 million of children are in need of their humanitarian assistance, while around 440 schools have been closed due to armed conflict. When we can go through the context, DRC has many, many problems related to children because we have uh, separated children. There are so many. Kafag is in DRC. Kidnappings are in DRC. Attacks to schools and health centers. These cases are ex existing in DRC. We have many cases of separations, yearly marriage to children, and many other impact related to this conflict. Nowadays, the number of affected children have really increased, but the context is showing that humanitarian stakeholders, actors, especially the government doesn't have strong capacity to respond to this crisis. From this alliance meeting, it's a call to action. Together we have to act. We have to do so much work to ensure that we are responding to this kind of crisis. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jonas. It's very good to be reminded of the, some of the forgotten crises. I'm not sure we'd call DRC a forgotten crisis, but perhaps it's been forgotten a little bit in this meeting. Um, so Ron, I think the call to action's a little bit with you. In your role as coordinator of the Global Child Protection, well, I'll call you CPAOR for short, what are your biggest takeaways from this meeting, both in relation to the situation we're facing as a sector, and in terms of the implications for how we coordinate our humanitarian actions in child protection. Thanks, Camilla. Now, just first, I want to echo what, what, what Marco said um, and an appreciation for the fact that we have the meeting in this region. Um, I think it was definitely very exciting to and, a, and an enriching experience as it allowed us really to zoom in on, the, on a particular region and, and the, the issues that here are here at stake, the, the, the child protection uh, in the region, the challenges, but also to learn about all the solutions and, and, uh, and the programs that are being put in place to prevent and respond to violence, abuse and exploitation. Um, and um, definitely for me, I've learned a lot from, from all the work that you are doing here and from the situation. I must say, where well, before coming here, I, I read the um, I read the background paper, and um, it was pretty sobering and a bit of a depressing reality check. Not that I wasn't aware of all these issues; I, I deal with it on a daily basis. I read about it. I hear about it from our coordinators. Um, I hear about the the protection risks the children are facing, the violations of their rights. Um, the statistics that are keep go going up and uh, to remember that behind those statistics are real children. And just that every day there seems to be a new crisis. There seems to be a um, crisis that just continue, the protected ones like, like the DRC. And yeah, it's just, I came here really in a bit of a gloomy mood. <laughs> But the, the, on the other side, uh, now coming out of those three days, I'm, I'm much more positive. And, and that's thanks to you and all the work that you, that you are doing. I think it gives me a bit more hope that um, despite all the challenges that we are facing, and, um, and the issues are many, and we've heard the, the funding gap and, and, and uh, the the amount of people that that continue to be displaced, the the right violations that happen every day, the situations children that, that children are experiencing, what they shouldn't be experiencing as children. 
but listening to all the 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 presentations and 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 being in the different sessions it's it just shows how much is happening and how much you you are doing uh, that you've demonstrated in the presentations the good practices the impact of the work on children and their families the professional way in which you you design you implement and also assess the work the way we are constantly looking at how we can improve what we are doing and i think we've come a long way as a child protection sector um, and i really want to express my my huge appreciation for for all the work that you do to to make this world a better place for children and i know it's not easy but it's great to see that we have solutions and um, and uh, we, we are getting better at how we are protecting children in, in this world. As a coordinator, I was also very pleased to, to, to hear throughout the, the three days and also the first day we were here uh, and, and to hear about the situation in this region that you were talking about coordination. So that made me very happy. I didn't have to push that. You were coming with it yourself. And, um, and also to, to, to say that, okay, if there is no coordination, we need to work on it. And if it's not working, we're trying to improve it. Um, so it was, was, for me, it was, was very positive to, to hear that. And of course, you were not just talking about clusters and AORs, but coordination groups, and, and uh, including in, in contexts where there are no cluster approach so that was that was good to hear and and it was important it was was good to hear that you found it as something that was important um, and and understanding that with so many issues no single agency can do it on its own with limited resources we can't afford to duplicate with the complex issues we have to deal with we need to come together to find and implement solutions rather than compete with each other. I also take away the importance of, of being inclusive in our coordination mechanisms and adapt the mechanism to the, to the contexts, ensuring that we are working very closely with, with governments, with national governments, with local governments, um, and ideally that they drive that coordination effort, that we're working with local NGOs and communities and really make them part and owners of, of those coordination mechanisms. And then the other thing uh, that I would like to, to mention before I, I stop here, um, we also need to, to continue to, to work together as child protection practitioners, um, as child protection coordination groups with other sectors, with other coordination groups and continue to strengthen that work. We've, listen to many presentations around working across sectors to to integrate to mainstream child protection in their work and to really work together to reach the same children the same child that is affected by malnutrition by displacement by health issues and we need to to break those silos to really come with multi-sectoral programs and let other people do their child protection responsibilities as well such as on Early Childhood Development and MHPSS. Thank you very much, Ron. Okay, so Nouria, over to you, last but not least, for the first round of questions. In your capacity as a donor staff specializing in protection, what is your perspective on how strengthened child accountability mechanisms, including child participation, can help us better prevent and respond to child protection in the midst of escalating crises, including the role Global Affairs Canada can play? Thank you. Um, firstly, I want to thank the Alliance, not only for this wonderful meeting, uh, but also for the meaningful inclusion of children in the past few days as panelists, as session leaders, um, and as speakers as well. Particular thanks to Grace and Victoria and Sergio for your recent remarks. Um, it has been very meaningful and useful to hear voices, to hear your voices speak directly to what is most important to you. I loved your session, Victoria. I would have to say, and no offense to the others, it was my favorite session this week. <laughs> um, 
And Grace was absolutely correct that children are our present. We and all of you know, I don't need to say this, that children have a right to be heard in all matters affecting them. Of course, this is enshrined in Article 12 of the Convention on the Rights of the Child. And over the last few days, we have been appropriately reminded of the importance of child participation and accountability. Um, as a donor, Canada strives to keep the voices of children at the forefront of topics that affect them directly. In doing so, we work directly with organizations um, that have the child protection expertise and who have experience in facilitating the participation of children and youth in international fora in a safe and meaningful way. At Women Deliver in Rwanda last year, Canada worked with Plan International Canada to facilitate the participation of adolescent girls alongside ministers during key events. Um, in collaboration with World Vision Canada, Canada established a Refugee Education Council of Refugee Youth Advisors as part of our Together for Learning campaign. This council is our commitment to empowering and listening to the voices and perspectives of children and youth and ensuring they have meaningful opportunities to influence the decisions that imp impact their lives. We are also one of two bilateral donors to Together for Girls, a global partnership uh, committed to ending violence against children. At the domestic level in Canada, the Prime Minister started a youth council um, in 2016. And so this youth council is comprised of 10 uh, nonpartisan Canadian youth aged 16 to 24. And they advise the Prime Minister on education, the economy, climate change, and other issues that directly affect them. That said, I think we do need to be careful in the way that we advocate for child participation and how we engage children in certain situations. As we move forward and in your work in advocating, um, I think we should be intentional in that all work that we do around child participation at our level should be in cooperation with CSOs and with NGOs that have proper child protection mechanisms built into their processes. I think doing so creates a built-in protection mechanism and ensures that the best interest of the child is always held as the paramount and the most important. As a country, we'll continue to work towards ensuring the voices of children are included whenever possible in a safe and meaningful way. Thank you, Nuri. It's been great to have you here this week, and it's great to hear we have another child participation champion amongst us. Okay, so we're going to move to a second round of questions. Um, so, Marco, as a lead in the area of integration between education and child protection um, in emergencies, from your experience at World Vision and from what you've heard this week, how do you think cross-sectoral co collaboration can be strengthened to better protect children? in this context of, of escalation, reduced access, and the gap between needs and funding. Thank you, Camila. So I'll, I'll try to go back to the experience of the past year between the child protection sector and the education sector to elaborate and try to respond to your question. So we said many times, children, they don't see themselves divided in sectors. So they think, oh, this is part of education, this is part of child protection, this health. So silos are a product of bureaucracy and not reality. And I stole this quote from Rachel McKinley. So we cannot deny that there are specialized competencies. And yesterday our donor were pretty clear. Child protection is not everyone's job. And, but it is equally true that child protection is not a self-sufficient sector and we need to collaborate across the spectrum of all the different sectoral specificity to address child well-being holistically. We are humanitarian for a reason, and the reason is we respect the human being in its integrity and integrality. First of all, I'm thinking at the natural connection between child protection and education. I, I go back to one meeting we had between the Global Education Cluster and the Global CPUR in 2018. It was a joint meeting, and I recall a discussion where we discuss how education as the most universal service <clears throat> can aspire to make the outcome of protecting children universal. And going back also to the children perspective, 
we have heard in every single needs assessment and in many occasion that in consultation with the children, for example, how important it is for them and their family that they receive education even in early stages of a, a crisis. Quality education per se is perceived as a protection and this is a result of the work that we have done child protection specialists, child protection practitioners, along with educators. And if I think of the great progress made in the partnership between child protection and education, I think the ecology of the child offered, for example, a great opportunity to go beyond the traditional concept of service provision that for ages has been at the center of EIE programs, for example, putting at the center of the education community the Comunidad Educante, I don't know if uh, my Spanish is good, but I think it's a concept that come from Freire, the child and not the service. The off the press news about the work the Alliance is doing on competency sector, competency framework with other sectors such as health, camp management and food security is a promised move to engage at the same level also with other sector. And going back to my previous remark, it is great that to see that integrated programming is also a priority for our best friend's donor. Looking forward, I think the Alliance might have to dig deeper on the implications of promoting child protection mainstreaming vis-a-vis -vis integrated programming from a programming, a cost, and a capacity perspective. Ron has shared his key takeaways on coordination, but one specific remark I want to highlight is that cross-sectoral cooperation should happen at all levels, coordination, sorry, should happen at all levels, programmatic, advocacy, monitoring, evaluation, competency, and coordination, obviously, is the key factor of all of it. I finished. Lovely, thank you. <laughs> Just this morning, we have the great example of the discussion happening in the Venezuela clusters, for example. And putting my education hat on, I would I also flag that there are also interesting experience to coordinate in emergency around child well-being themes such as early childhood development, such as happening in Ukraine, for example, rather than on a cross sector. Thank you. Thank you. Plenty of food for thought coming out from this panel for those who are still awake, <laughs> not thinking of the airport. Okay, so Jonas, you've described the escalating situation in DRC. Um, what pressures does this put on local child protection system or the local child protection system in Eastern DRC? And what do you think should be done about this in light of this week's discussions? From my experience, and based to the social ecological model to protect the children. I think that uh, armed conflict and uh, crisis within climate change have a very biggest impact to child protection. As we may know from different contexts, the first way where a child needs to be protected is a family. But while families are not stable, they are coming from their villages, forced to leave their families. That means that uh, the protection is broken from there because the families are not stable. They are forced to be displaced. But also armed conflict and the crisis have impact on community-based child protection because existing CBOs and all mechanisms at the community level within referral mechanism, they are not operating while armed conflict are happening and when also crises are happening. You have to understand that uh, social workers cannot be working also during the crisis because they have also to save themselves. They have to go back from their works and also sometimes the government doesn't have control to existing systems because they don't, uh, governments doesn't have uh, access, for example, in occupied zones. And the children don't have access to basic services like health, clean water, education. 
psychosocial support. Children don't have opportunities to access their services due to armed conflict and uh, crisis. I think that uh, what can be done should be advocacy. Advocating to children is most key because uh, we have to influence and to push governments and stakeholders to have a focus on children, especially investing in child protection. But also, as uh, Marco said and Ron, working across sector is very, very, very important because we need health, we need food security, we need psychosocial support, we need education, and many other services because responding to children during armed conflict and the climate change require a joint effort and no one, no partner can be able to respond to needs. That's for why working across sector should be also a focus while we need to responding to needs of children. Thank you. Thank you, Jonas. Okay, so Ron, returning to our coordination focus, can you share a little of what the CPAOR's experiences and perspectives on how the contextual factors we've been discussing this week, escalating crises, the funding gap, um, limited access, are affecting our approaches to protecting children? Yeah, I think, and I said that in also the answer to, my, to the first question, it really requires us to coordinate. We, we have to be, it helps us to, to, uh, to identify the common goals. It helps us to identify what approaches bring us the most impact, identify the children most in need, the areas most impacted by, by conflict, by violence, by natural disasters. Um, it helps us to, to think about where, where do we have a presence, where is our support most needed, and coordinate that response in, uh, in, in countries. Um, and having all the actors together in, in a coordination group also allows us to, to really build on our collective knowledge, our experiences and resources, on the local knowledge and experience of, of the partners in, in the um, local and national actors in the coordination groups, and to also better together prioritize our work. And of course, coordination goes beyond just coordinating planning and programming, service delivery or, or prioritizing jointly. As we also heard several times during this, this week, we also need to do robust advocacy together to bring together a powerful child protection voice, a joint one, to advocate with donors, to advocate with governments, and sometimes even to advocate in our own organizations to make sure that child protection is high on the agenda. Um, secondly, we also need to get better at, at finding the opportunities to work and with and through other sectors, as, as Jonas and, 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 uh, and Marco were also saying. For example, this is some work we've been doing in, in Somalia. Are our nutrition colleagues monitoring the nutrition status in areas where, where we do not have access as child protection actors or we don't have a capacity or a presence there. Can we train them to, to spot child protection issues and then report that back to, to the child protection actors and community? We're doing it more and more and, and with the tools, the guidance and, and the training materials on working across sectors that are available or, or are in the pipeline. And some of the joint work that we've, we've seen already during those, these days that we're doing with other sectors. Um, we have all the opportunities to, to make a big leap in this area. It would be interesting to see next year how far we've come in this, in this, this area where we need to, to mobilize others. And I think it also obviously fits well with the, the alliance's concept of the centrality of protection of children and their and their protection, and then also 
what was being emphasized in, in quite a number of, of sessions is um, the, the participation of, of children, the participation of communities in identifying issues, in identifying solutions, in prioritizing. And um, so this, we're moving, I'm facing They're trying to move us on, I think. <laughs> We've still got one more re remarks to go. Closing <laughs> Excuse closing us, Ron. Music. Okay. Um, so, um, so I was saying the participation of communities, and we we clearly heard in the in the different sessions that that working with communities, community-led initiatives, are not a pipe dream. That are perfectly possible, even in humanitarian settings. Um, it also means, in, in particularly HNO and HRP context, that we need to strengthen the involvement and participation of children and communities in needs assessment and helping us to find solutions and prioritize the, the, the issues and the responses. We've also, we've also heard um, in the recent uh, IDP, independent IDP review, that there's a lack of participation of internally displaced persons and emphasizing again the need for participation of, of populations that are affected by crisis. The examples over the past uh, days demonstrate that consultation, participation um, are possible and that we can continue to do better in it. Um, and finally, I just want to, to mention a couple of other issues that have come across that have caught my attention over the past days in terms of how do we address some of those challenging issues is, is strengthening our work with governments on child protection systems to really make an extra effort on localization to work with local and national actors who are best placed um, to, to know the context and, and, and are at the front line of, of the responses and also strengthening prevention it's sustainable, it's cost effective, and it's an ethical responsibility. And then finally, finally, I just want to say that like you, you come away from this meeting with energy, with motivation, with lots of new ideas on what we can do better to, to protect children. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. <laughs> well, to come in last, Noria, um, Jonas and Ron have both mentioned advocacy and I believe you're going to pick up on that in this final piece. I'd like to invite you to take, uh, to give us your take on some of the ways that CSOs and NGOs can engage with states to progress child protection um, and ensure accountability to children. So over yeah. to you. Thank you. Um, I love this question. Uh, I think our other donors in yesterday's session did a great job of answering this, so I hope I'm not too repetitive in some of the things that I say, but I would reiterate what they said in engage with us directly, advocate when possible, and if you see a gap in the way in which we're working, engage with us and let us know. Um, for major strategic moments, for example, such as the upcoming Ministerial Conference on Ending Violence Against Children, your voice can help shape and determine if and how Canada engages. Um, knowing, for example, what, what you need and expect is important to inform uh, decision making across all levels of our government. Um, and then I just want to mention one thing because it's exciting. Um, in countries where we do have embassies, we welcome opportunities to engage directly with young people and youth-led organizations and to learn about opportunities to strengthen our policy and programming in those countries and internationally from those on the ground, uh, which is many of you. And to support this, our missions manage an envelope of funding um, for small local organizations. And this is called the Canadian Fund for Local Initiatives. And since we love acronyms, you can call it the CFLI. Um, and these grants average around $31,000 each. So these projects are planned and implemented by local organizations and are reviewed and selected by the relevant Canadian embassies or high commissions. So they don't ever actually get up to HQ, which makes it a little bit easier. Um, in the region currently, there are calls for proposals in uh, Jamaica and Haiti. So if you work in either of those contexts, I, I encourage you to engage with those missions. Um, 
What's more, our multilateral partnerships include substantial engagement in the region and are typically well connected with local and regional actors. You can take a look of our website on Project Browser. It's a Canadian website and you can see all of the projects that we support and you can engage with those organizations as well. Um, linking as well to, someone, to what some of our colleagues mentioned on, on stage of cross-sectoral cross cooperation. Um, as we strive to improve our capacity to support local-led, locally-driven initiatives, strengthening these partnerships is, is very important to us. Um, and then on the other hand, if you are a partner of Global Affairs Canada, I want to remind you that the opportunity to submit your um, reporting is an, also an opportunity to give us feedback. There's a place there for you to put in a narrative on how we can be making these processes better, how we can be using tools differently um, and uh, improve those policies as well. Um, and of course, the Alliance, um, your independent research reports, policy briefs and are key tools and they truly help inform our work um, and how we go about creating policies as well. So whether you're an independent researcher in academia or you're working with or on behalf of youth, be sure to share these tools with us because we do read them and we do use them internally and they're super helpful. Um, I've had an opportunity to speak with a few of you over the last couple of days and to be honest, I've learned so much in such a short period. You and your organizations are also rich in experience and understanding of not only the region, but also quite complex global uh, issues, and we can learn from you. So please do know that the opportunity to brief our department is always open. If you have a new tool that you want to share or just want to brief us on a situation that you're working on, please do reach out to me and I can put you in contact with the right people in our department. Um, for example, we have brown bag lunches where we invite organizations to come and speak. Um, and so if you do wanna work together in the future, just reach out to me. Uh, but yes, thank you all again for the important work that you're all doing on child protection. It has been such a pleasure learning and sharing space with you this past week. Thank you. Well, it's exciting to end with an offer and it's exciting to end with you asking us to hold you to account. So I appreciate that. I hope that you don't mind that we've gone slightly over time. When we arrived in the region, we were told, including in the background paper from Pedro, that we're in the region we shouldn't put form over function. So I hope you found it worth taking an additional five or 10 minutes to hear from these important speakers. Hani also has some mo words of thanks to close us out. So I'll let our panelists leave the stage and hand to Hani to close us out. Thank you very much. I wanted to say um, the only thing that I will say from my long list of closing remarks is that uh, some of you came knowing this space, knowing the Alliance and already feeling part of the family. Some of you didn't. And I think a lot of you that are from this region might not have engaged with the Alliance before. I really hope that now that you're leaving, you feel like the Alliance is yours. As Marco said, it's the Alliance belongs to you and the Alliance is you. So if you don't feel like it is yours, then there's a problem, we did something wrong. So I hope that you all leave feeling part of the family. So I need to uh, thank a lot of people. Um, I will start with uh, Kata and Margaret and Kendra, if she's here. Listen, Kim. Kata, Margaret and Kendra, can you come up here, please? Come up here. Now we have a big list of facilitators. Anita is not here. Beatrice, Domenico, please come up here. And I want to hear a lot of clapping as they come up. Elena, Francisco, Gervinder, Joanna, Joy, Katie, Khadija, Lavinia, Mara, Tisera, Marcello, Marta, Michelle, Raniere, Riyad, Sandra, Sarah Harris, Cezanne, who's not here, Sylvia, Stephanie, another Stephanie, Susanna, Veronica, Victoria, Yvonne, and of course, 
the Secretariat team. Please, everyone from the Secretariat team, come up here. Sorry. Go, 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 go. Make space. And I want Camilla to stand in the middle, in the front, because she really was very central to all of this. And Pedro, and Elspeth, and Manami, and Kira, and everyone else. Thank you very much. Are we going to give them a bow? Are we going to give them a bow? <laughs> Thank you so much for everything you have done. We have something small for you as you leave. We're going to give it to you. But also to thank the interpreters, the venue staff, the tech team, um, security, everyone who has helped. Thank you very much. And all of you for coming here and being with us. Thank you very much. <laughs>